to the Stop Walking Around podcast. I'm John Cronshaw and I'm back today with two guests. Today we are going to talk about a interesting subject. I think at the bottom of it we're essentially going to be talking about character and individuals and personas and things like that. So this was pitched to me by Ben who is with us. Oh yeah. And what Ben suggested was bringing together someone who develops personal branding and someone who helps musicians develop their artistic persona. And then, of course, there's me, who writes for a living. So this is going to be an interesting discussion, I hope. So, Chris, if you want to introduce yourself, tell us what you do. My name's Chris O'Gorman. I uh, run a uh, digital consultancy called Meledra Digital. Um, and my background is basically working mostly in the music industry. Um, I've worked for universal music as head of digital at capital records and um, before that at sony music uh, as a digital manager and my roles at both of those companies was it's essentially launching artists the the sort of digital online brand identity and then the digital marketing of that so launching acts like sam smith for uh, five seconds of summer one direction little mix Solly Mers, all of these you know very digitally led projects where telling their sort of personal story and uh, sort of cementing their brand identity online was in some ways almost mm, not more important, but came before the actual marketing of the actual music product. So that's sort of my uh, background in a nutshell. Excellent. And same for you, Ben. Okay. So um, I, I do three things. I'm a dad. I do some property investment, but my main kind of, I mean, the, the dad thing, there's a link here because I'm, I'm interested in uh, my kids and, and their development. So there's a, there's something there. And and the other thing as well is I'm a lecturer over at Leeds College of Music and I teach one-to-one singers on the pop program there. It's built into the course over at um, LCOM, Leeds College of Music, that the, uh, the artists that we work with are trying to build and develop their own brand. Now, I'm personally less interested in the kind of the the financial side as far as this discussion is concerned i really i mean that that is really probably more like chris's domain in terms of how do you reach customers um that kind of thing um for me it, i'm interested for this uh, as with the the art side of it so by presenting yourself on stage in a certain way, what are you saying to the people in the room watching you? You know, and so that's really where we're at. I write mainly speculative fiction, so science fiction and fantasy. I do it full time, and I am very much concerned with creating memorable characters that people hook on to and want to read more of. My first question, I suppose, for you is why have you brought us together? <laughs> right yeah because we're just in the just before we, we got we got properly going you asked what, like what are we even talking about i'm not 100 percent sure i don't know if it has a name no doubt it does but whatever it is it's the thing that kind of draws people to either other characters or possibly like other brands so it's kind of what is the thing that attracts people to something else or someone else you know, it's kind of like when you read a book, you know, there's a sense of whether a character is good or not. There's a sense when you're when you're watching an artist perform, there's a sense of, oh, I really like that. You know, I really like, mm. you know, whether it's how they're dressed or I feel like there's something deeper below that as well. It's not just how they are physically and practically dressed. It's like what's being spoken to in the person that's attracted to that yeah you know the thing that sits beneath the kind of the veneer yeah. does that make sense yeah to i you, mean to a- you? absolutely it, it completely makes sense to me from sort of an art you know from developing music artists um mm. because the thing that you know because as many of the hit artists that i've worked on there have been ones that did not work <laughs> right <laughs> i won't name yeah. uh, and the difference is people bought into the successful ones and it wasn't just the music because the ones that didn't work had just as good music were just as talented and it wasn't that it was an extra thing it was what 
made people buy into these other artists like Samsung, etc. What made people buy into them as a person? What made them connect their sort of music to their personality? And then why did that resonate with people, particularly to the point where they felt passionate enough about it to consider themselves a band? Because, uh, like I said, there's many artists I've worked with that haven't been able to connect those dots even though the music is just as good so that doesn't completely make sense it's a sort of it's a bit of a formula well trying to find the formula (laughs) yeah but uh, i mean this is part of this is part of why i wanted to have the discussion because there might be some stuff that john knows about what makes Mm. a decent character you know Mm. what is a good character what's uh, and maybe maybe there's some overlap um, and and by the by the so, yeah. by the same token, it, it's kind of from the music side of things. What's the overlap? And I was I was hoping with you, Chris, as well. I mean, I know obviously like the music is a big a big side of what you do, but you've also been looking. You've also been working with some some like non musical brands as well. Am I right? Mm. Yeah, yeah. We because that, that, we, that what would we do be a really actually... interesting angle as well. You know, yeah. to, to hear how. Yeah. <laughs> Because maybe it spreads out beyond just kind of character development and artist development. Maybe it spreads out into the wider world of business too. You know, oh, I don't. It totally does because a yeah. lot of the work we do as well is actually with public figures in general. So a lot of the times that might be business leaders, people where their sort of personal story of how they built their business, scaled it up. You know employed a a bunch of people of you know launched a successful brand it's their personal story is actually so connected to the success of their company so actually Mm -hmm. a lot of the work we do is personal branding for those sort of i guess you call them thought leaders yeah uh, or business leaders so it's their personal branding and then doing that obviously online digitally and how you tell their story in a creative interesting way because it can be because especially because that side of things can be extremely dry and boring and corporate yeah so it's sort of bringing the experience from the entertainment side which is a lot more fun a lot more creative <laughs> and then applying that to sort of more professional industries i suppose mm. business leaders. and absolutely it's the same thing it's you know people buy into the story of steve jobs and bill gates and uh, even mark zuckerberg you know people buy into their personal stories which yeah. there have been films about many many films about them the way i'm seeing this is is just to go back to i suppose what ben said he was looking for but couldn't quite articulate it. i'm thinking of it as something like a personal empathic connection to the other with something mm. that resonates mm. if that makes sense <laughs> yeah yeah we're yeah. getting there with that we're yeah. getting there with that definitely yeah so, that resonation is because i i, I think there's like humans I, th- I think we are narrative creatures aren't we like we yeah. look for story yeah you and know I, yeah I think, maybe even when it's not there but we look do you know what i mean we are pre-wired for story i think it's like the pattern recognition thing where yeah. we will create a narrative even when there isn't one there like we'll mm-hmm. see something we'll see some litter on the ground and we can think oh somebody has dropped that you know we already mm-hmm. attach a story a series of events in our minds that might not necessarily yeah. be true but mm. it's a fiction yeah when i think of characters i i think about I me mean, first of all i want the voice and i think the voice is important in terms of how the character sounds so this is i suppose how they're presenting themselves but then obviously this ties into things like plot and theme and the thing that i, I i've even got it stuck on a post-it note is intention obstacle so mm-hmm. whenever i'm writing a story i want to know what the character wants what their aims are but also what is in the way and i think when we've got these mm-hmm. stories of business people and you know there's always obstacles there's always things they've had to overcome whether it's you know a poor background or that to stop people trying to steal their ideas or something like that or yeah. there has to be a story it has to be an obstacle there has to be almost yeah. an antagonistic force that they've overcome which makes them seem heroic in some way interesting Yes, so, absolutely. So that absolutely. need for them to have been, yeah, it's like a challenge. It links to the kind of hero story, doesn't it? It's a something has to happen that's blocking them, and they have to overcome that, or there has to be some method by which they do. I think that links back to you know the when we've got the old hero myths and the old hero stories where we've got a character we look up to 
they've mm. gone through these trials and tribulations like an Achilles or someone like that. But today, we don't have the same heroes. We don't have the same type of hero. So I think there's almost a need to put that heroic journey. You know, Joseph Campbell talks about the hero's journey, this kind of arc of going through different challenges. Like We almost have to put that onto the people who are maybe the higher station, the singers and the, you know, the mm, biggest leaders yeah. and Project things like it. that. How do I know this is going to somehow end up back at Trump? But <laughs> <laughs> people, do, people do that to, I think you're absolutely right, people do that to entertainers, to many people in the public eye, and that ultimately includes politicians and political leaders as well. People mm. project a story onto them yeah. that actually isn't even remotely true, and that's sort of what you get with Trump there, is that people have created this narrative in their heads of him being the underdog when he absolutely oh, isn't so you've just touched on something there you've just touched on the authenticity thing and and i was hoping that we could get into that would we be able to just put a pin in that and and and, and get to that yeah. later because i think that's vital and it's a really important part of the discussion i just wanted to you mentioned joseph campbell john could you just explain who he is and what yeah yeah so so he was a theorist and he was writing in i think from the 50s and 60s that kind of time and he was inspired by a psychologist called carl jung and what he looked at was these really deep patterns that exist in stories across the world so he, he ended up coming up with this thing called a monomyth which right. is basically that a hero story from south africa would actually echo a hero story from Japan, which in turn would echo a hero story. You know, like the Jesus resurrection story is another one of these heroic archetypes. So he yeah. saw this all over the world, all these patterns. And he, I think he kind of concluded that there was basically one type of hero story. And now we see that over and over again with Star Wars, with Harry Potter, with The Matrix. All these stories follow the same mm. kind of underlying, like really deep structure and when it does, when it hits, it resonates and we feel it. And there's just something so deep that we can't even kind of understand it. And when a story doesn't kind of hit that, it feels wrong or it disappoints or it lets us down. Yeah, because, I mean, that, like Jung, I've used that stuff with my students in the past. Um, you know, the, the archetypes and getting them to kind of really have a think about whereabouts on that wheel you know the have you, have you heard of the the 12 the 12 archetype wheel have you heard of that chris no i haven't actually okay that's okay you probably have john if you've it i don't, like I don't, I don't know about the, the 12 archetype wheel actually that's uh, okay for me um because i've been looking yeah because campbell comes up i think he's got about eight archetypes that he works with so that's yeah okay if you imagine a wheel there's orientation so there's freedom order uh, social and ego so at the top of the wheel if you imagine the top we've got freedom and then directly below that there's the outlaw and then on the opposite side of the wheel which is kind of your order area directly opposite the outlaw you've got the ruler right or the leader or the king and the, this outlaw slash rebel is opposed to the king but they're also linked and connected I won't go through all all twelve, okay. but I'll, I'll think I know these are like the hero caregiver, rebel, hero caregiver, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, um, digging in my mind magician, yeah. lover, creator, every man, innocent explorer, right. yeah. And it's this this notion that these kind of archetypes kind of arise in story and in myth and in reality as well. And I, th I think that's maybe part of it is I think that we've all got like at least bits of all of them in us. And maybe our, our kind of unique blend of them is our personality, perhaps. So it's kind of like they're opposing, but they're also linked and connected. And, you know, you get stuff kind of, kind of like the rebel might win, win the rebellion and become the ruler, you know. And then there's a flip back, for example. And then you've got this thing with, like, the sage and the jester, for example, they're opposite. You know, sage being the kind of the person that's really into kind of sort of serious learning you know, mm -hmm. and the, the wise old owl, yeah. wise, right. And the jest is the guy that, that takes the piss. Do you know what I mean? And everything's a joke. Yeah. But the, the flip of that is often the jester, the joker, the person that's taking the piss all the time is often the one that can really tell the truth in a way that maybe the sage couldn't. And so the jester can then flip and become the sage. Do you know what I mean? So there's yeah. this thing about 
them being connected and linked, but also opposite, which is, is also really dead interesting. So do you use those eight for your character development then, John? Your, the Campbell's ones? You know what, I don't, because it's, it's kind of more organic than that, I suppose. I don't, I don't sit there and go, right, I want this character to be like this and, you know, kind of look at those boxes. I think the nearest I do to that is... I don't know if you've ever played Dungeons and Dragons, <laughs> but there's basically, <laughs> there's basically a character alignment sheet that I've found really useful. And um, I talked about this on an earlier episode of Stop Booking Around, but this is basically about someone being their chaos and order alignment, chaos versus lawful, and then whether they're evil or good or neutral. So you can have like a chaotic good, which is someone who does good things, but is a bit kind of random and, you know, doesn't necessarily follow the rules, but they are okay. really good. So I usually think of this in terms of how can I get my character from lawful good to chaotic evil? So this will be a journey of, you know, someone basically the Breaking Bad storyline, for example, that follows yeah, yeah. that arc. That's almost how I do it. And then I'll kind of think of the points where that I can hit, where I think, okay, in the hero's journey, for example, there's a bit where the character must leave his normal world. So I need a point maybe about 20% through the story where that's it. He's got to leave the home village and go out into the world into an unfamiliar place and learn lots of things along the way. So 20%? Yeah, I find that's that's significant. Good. Right. That just, for you, feels right with your writing or is that like a rule that lots of writers will... I think a lot of writers use that kind of area. You usually find yeah. 20, 25%. If your character is still at home moaning about their life, they haven't moved on, it's going to be boring. Right, yeah. I think the only story I've seen that has done that well, where it's got a really, really long first bit, is Life is Beautiful, which is, I don't know if you've ever seen that film, but I think the first hour or so of that is just this guy's happy life, and then because it's Mm. about him going to the concentration camps, it actually makes it a lot more horrible <laughs> you know, right so. would you yeah. say that's flipped on its head though like is it is it 75 percent with 25 percent at the at the end it's, that's brutal it's, or it might be the halfway point something like okay. that so it doesn't kind of fit that convention in the same way but i think that when you look at movies when you look at the three-act structure you know this is in matrix where neo goes into the matrix he takes the pill and mm. it's in star wars where luke leaves his home planet because he's you know he's found that his adopted parents have been burnt to death like mm. that point appears again and again it's harry potter going to hogwarts you know yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, that kind of thing. right lord of the lord of the rings as well starts up in you know in exactly. the shire and it's yeah and he leaves uh, and he has to go out into the yeah world okay so that 20 25 percent is a significant ratio uh, like number that might be worth thinking about are there any others of those just whilst we're on them I know in music there's this notion of the of the golden section, one point six one or so, and roughly two thirds of the way right. way through. So two thirds of the way through will be your all is lost moment in mm. a lot of stories. So this is the bit where everything has gone wrong for your main character. There's no way out. It, okay. Everything yeah. seems like yeah. it's going terrible, but then okay, maybe they bring together an idea from the first act, the you know the old world, and then a new idea from the new world. Yeah bring them together and then you've got the finale and battles and all that so that's the belly yeah. of the whale moment right 66 yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 and and then i think uh tolkien called that the u catastrophe i think uh, when okay. it's like the opposite of the, the the catastrophe has happened and it's that all is lost and then there's a glimmer of light and so you know yeah and it and it sort of flips i'm sure he called it that the the u catastrophe and, uh. and again you see that in in lords of the rings i think that moment when he's um wrapped up in a in a spider's web yeah yeah um, bit in star wars where ben kenobi dies you know we yeah uh, mm. we we've, yeah luke's whole futures at doubt you know and and same with the matrix it's like what's his name um, is it cyrus cyrus uh, he betrays everyone and um you know, yes. so it's, yeah. it's all those moments where it looks unescapable and i think i suppose this goes back to the personas and you know de- developing brands maybe it's those moments where we kind of empathize with people who hit rock bottom we empathize with the people who've 
had trying times and then got through it. And I think that is that's the important bit, isn't it? It's like how low can you go and then how high can you go after that? I think that's probably where empathy comes in. Well, it's interesting you're like, saying this about the wheel, about the archetype hmm. wheel, because I suppose I haven't really consciously ever done this, but I think brands absolutely do this as well, because, you know, if you take Apple, they're the creator. Nike is seen as the hero. Something like PG Tips is every man. So I think brands actually do that as well. Something like Dub or Innocent Smoothies or something like that, you know, is the innocent archetype. So actually... It's something I hadn't actually consciously considered, but it really, you, like when you when you start working with a brand, when I've worked for a brand as a client, or again, with an artist or a public figure, you do subconsciously actually go through, I think, this wheel that you mentioned and try and sort of pinpoint who they are. And how do you get there when you're working with them? Like, do you just, just discuss it and then something yeah, this co- appears to you? The starting point is just observing and downloading sort of who they are and just so, sort of like before I um, worked on the sort of marketing and development side, I worked as a journalist, as a music journalist. So a lot of those skills come into play because you're essentially interviewing them as, as if you're writing a piece on them, as if you're writing an editorial feature on them. So it's it really is sort of, sh- you know, shadowing them, downloading who they are and then trying to distill it afterwards. So it's a lot of observing, I suppose. And then maybe polishing that up a little bit (laughs) very few people are any one thing it's probably combinations of these archetypes or it's um you know sort of i guess sliding you know maybe moving around that archetype wheel a little bit and in terms of character development so Mm. so no one is, is is any one thing um but when you're working with music artists or a public figure or whoever it is you get the strongest sense of who they are. This is something that sort of shines out more than anything. And that's kind of what you amplify. So it's essentially taking who they are and finding ways to really amplify that and maybe exaggerate that. So one of the examples is is a bit of a bittersweet one, I suppose, actually. It's it's not one that I worked on particularly, but I sort of saw it happening. Um, And it's Amy Winehouse. And I remember that it was very much like... She has this oh this wild child sort of you know rock and roll persona and absolutely that was they were like ah this is this is marketable you know this is something we can exaggerate and absolutely did and the sort of media lapped that up and that became almost her story and I think she started writing her own story in her head and it's make pure speculation now I think what what I saw happening there was because I recognized it in the work that I was doing with other artists where you create the narrative for that you don't create you you take the most uh, prominent parts of them and then focus on those and kind of amplify those that's what they sort of did with her and then that became sort of that <laughs> became a bit of a runaway train yeah well I think what happens is then also because you have to remember you're working with a human being with a this thing you, the, this is the real difficult area and it's, it's one i still struggle with actually is that you're working with a human being and actually unlike creating a fictional character their story doesn't end when you put down the pen <laughs> it continues and actually a lot of times i've seen them taking that story that you sort of creating it and almost really believing it and then really it almost becomes all consuming and i think that's sort of what happened with her a little bit i think that she believed this story that they'd created for her and to the point where it's like ah i'm gonna write and because you know she was actually an actress before as well and almost ended up living this role and then the ultimate conclusion of that is what happened working with young artists at elcon that's a real like kind of fear of mine you know like that yeah they buy too much into the brand or who you know who they are that i think it's really vital and, you know, I, I say this to all my students or, you know, as, as many as them, of, of them as I can, that, you know, when you step on a stage, something changes. Yeah, absolutely. Do you know what I mean? And you and see it. That, that, that stage is a it, metaphorical it. one, right? And I, I guess it becomes harder and harder the more if the more fame you attract into your life because the more people are taking pictures of you, the more they or and, you know, and following you around and writing the story for you or about you or, you know, like presenting you it within that light you can you, see it you, becoming harder and harder and harder for individuals to be able to you know as that happens to be able to draw that line and say well no 
like yeah. David Bowie is not Ziggy Stardust. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, but then you take that example. Yeah. He had to kill Ziggy Stardust. He had to kill yeah. that yeah. character yeah. to step away from it in the most dramatic way of doing it. Yeah, right. You know, and it's a bit like, I think probably maybe Lady Gaga is another good example of that. She absolutely created a character, amplified that character. I'm sure her marketing team obviously had a huge role in, in, in doing that. But I know before she wanted to be the, I guess, like the white stripes of stroke, that kind of vibe, you know, one okay. of kind of vibe. And, yeah. and absolutely, it was the people that she worked with, like, you know, dance is really happening now. And, you know, <laughs> and she's like, yeah, I write a dance song. That's easy. Like, <laughs> Wow, I didn't know that, that at all. Yeah, and that's the bit that kind of took off. She worked with Rob Busari, who produced, like, Destiny's Child and loads of other um, big pop and R&B acts. And then that became the story. And she created this narrative of this sort of larger than life character and then really believed it but then now i think you see her wanting to put that back in the box a little bit and hasn't gone to the uh, extreme of, of what david bowie did of killing off the character lady gaga could be different to whoever's next like she could kill lady well, gaga couldn't she and then and then be either do her or you know so i suppose i think yeah, what she's maybe. done is step away from, i think she's like lady gaga's off and running now and now yeah. i'm gonna step out of that skin and then what did she go and do she went and did a jazz covers duet album with tony bennett yeah <laughs> yeah right I mean, <laughs> yeah. very different then, place on the, the, the Jungian wheel isn't it the Jungian another, that wheel. and it's another character it's yeah. the 50s hollywood starlet it's a classic Hollywood archetype character that she's stepping into there. And then with her next role, it, and it's a, actually a uh, cinematic role in, in uh, Star Wars form, she stepped into another role. You might say that actually that's, that's just a continuation of the Hollywood starlet role, which probably is. She's almost that, fitting, though, into the Madonna role. Absolutely. And Madonna's another great example. And yeah. you, you said earlier about having it, uh, sort of having to overcome something her story really kind of is that to be honest. Yeah, like yeah, the yeah, reason yeah. that people resonate with her, I think, and that she's stood the test of time and has been around so long is that, you know, she has this story of really coming from pretty much nothing, like fairly abject poverty, to be honest with you. And, you know, this story that she has of, you know, leaving home when I think she was like 15 or something and having $20 in her pocket and saying to the cab driver, you know, take me to the center of everything and he took, drops her off at Times Square and she's like, okay, this is where I need to make stuff happen. I think that story, how, you know, separating myth from fact and how, you know, how true that is. And again, mm. I think whether even if it's not quite true, it probably is true. I think she's just embellished it and polished it up and that's become the thing. And to the point where she probably believes that that's exactly what happened. Does that it, matter? It, 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 no. Like the authenticity no, thing. So. Does it matter? Uh, so that you think no? I'm just intrigued. Again, if it's a um, out and out lie, and actually she uh, grew up in an extremely wealthy family and was uh, given loads of money to be able to put into her music career and didn't have to work jobs to, then that matters because that's a complete fabrication. Does that matter? You know. I'm going at this from the perspective of, you know, when you're talking about polishing a character, I see that in the same way that you would edit a character, you know, mm. and, and you you do, you bring out the the most important elements. So if a character gets too complicated, then in the genres that I write, that would actually muddy it for the reader and make an uh, experience that wouldn't be good. So mm. I try to yeah. create my character so they've got maybe a couple of flaws and you know, these are the things that drive them. And then it's, I'm building it around those few things. And then anything that I think goes off that too much, I'll edit it out. The mm. underlying thing of the character is still there. The archetype is still there. The authenticity thing, I mean, everything I'm doing is, is made up anyway. But Is it? And, and, and sorry for being <laughs> the guy that just asks questions and doesn't. <laughs> but is it, though? Because surely characters need to be at least a bit believable like that we surely we have to think that within the setting or the framework yeah, 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 of yeah. the story the character needs to be plausible or yeah. do we this question about truth i think is a vital one you know okay it's truth within the framework of the expectations if that makes sense so yeah. going to the madonna example if mm. we hear madonna's story and then we find out that it's a lie that would eject people from her story 
Mm-hmm. And it's like mm-hmm. the, the yeah. thing of if you've got a piece of literary fiction that is set, you know, a, a professor who's falling in love with a student, and then a genie turns up who summons a load of dragons, and then there's a zombie infestation, and you know, you think this is stupid. <laughs> yeah. But then yeah. you do that in Game of Thrones, and it's fine because it's expected yeah. within the framework. <laughs> so I think I think it's almost like you you have to be true to the story world, and I think you can have the story world as basically the framework for your pop star, the framework for whatever it is you're working mm. with. If PG Tips suddenly started advertising themselves in the same way that Taylor's a Harrogate does, people are just going to be, I'm not having that, that's, that's PG, you know. It's... <laughs> <laughs> if PG Tips suddenly all of a sudden like, here's our luxury tea bag, you know, our, our, our sort of Tesco's finest, I think people would be like, what? <laughs> no, <laughs> that's not, <laughs> you know, that's not the framework I know you in. That's yeah. not the place you occupy in my life. So if whoever it is yeah. that, that owns PG Tips decides that they want to do that, they, then no, that's a mm. different brand. It's a different narrative, it's oh, a yeah. different positioning, a different it's a whole, place. Whole, it's a whole new brand, yeah, exactly. Yeah. With the music thing, there is this kind of wooliness in that, isn't there? Unless artists are very careful to be really careful with where they place themselves and how they frame themselves. Mm. It's, um, you know, like we all knew that, Ziggy Stardust wasn't actually David Bowie and that was fine like that was built into the you know like the guys from Slipknot don't actually have those faces <laughs> yeah you know? of course like, it's, it's we, an we know that we, un- of... we understand yeah. the theatre and so it's not yes. like a surprise when when we see them without the mask on anymore do you know what I mean it reminds but, me of uh, wrestling actually you know the kind right. of suspension yeah. of disbelief that's required and also the fact that um, you know those personalities are people you know it might be their um, real personality yeah. but you know, turned up to 11 with the knob broken off. Absolutely. Or you mentioned what's, what's Trump really before, didn't you? you said that. Well, yeah. But, but, but <laughs> I was just going to jump off your wrestling um, analogy. What, into the, uh, WWE Hall of Famer Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, no, I was just going to say, um, you know, I think one of the reasons the TV show Glow has been so successful is it tells those stories and it does exactly what you just said it shows these this group of women that are brought into this weird world of uh, of wrestling and have to create their own characters the whole series is about them trying to figure out who their wrestling character is and then create it and then polish it and amplify it and sort of deliver it it's actually quite interesting i think that ties yeah. in and I actually think, really nice I think, I think with the glow as well the fact that your central character Zoya the destroyer you know her her thing is she yeah, yeah. she starts off and, and she's not a very sympathetic character because of what she's done it's interesting and I think it's the same with you know the director's character he's yes, very yeah, unsympathetic yeah. and then he very sympathetic so you really do end up feeling sympathy for these ones that you really shouldn't (laughs) yeah right feel sympathy i haven't seen it actually but it sounds dead interesting it's it's really good it's yeah yeah. and um i don't know if you saw cobra kai at all did you either of you see that one i didn't know i haven't it's basically a sequel to the karate kid starring the original cast Ah. but then obviously in their 40s maybe older and you've got the guy who is, is it Johnny? You know, the bad guy in the original mm. film. Like, he's now down yep. on his luck. He's the empathetic uh, character. Uh, and Danny is just a complete douchebag car salesman guy who <laughs> keeps going about the fact he won his karate championships back in the 80s. Amazing. <laughs> oh, my God. I love that. That's it's amazing. amazing well, that's interesting, isn't it? Because, again, like you were saying before about projecting... We, we have this sort of human need to project a story or a narrative onto somebody. I think when these films or stories that you love end, I, I don't know if anybody else does. I'm pretty sure that people do. I know I do. I think, oh, I wonder what happens afterwards. What I sort of write the story in my head of what happens after. Mm. So it's interesting that essentially a sequel follow on does exactly that. It tells the story of what happens afterwards, but flips it all. Going back to Donald Trump, like I, I was thinking about mm-hmm. this as you were talking and, um, I think the thing with Donald Trump is he's both a hero and an antagonist, depending on what side of the political Mm -hmm. spectrum you are. Because his story from his supporter's point of view is he's a guy who has overcome the mess in Washington. He's gone against the elites and now he has 
beaten the deep state and now he's ruling them. And people were saying that Hillary should have won. Who is this, mm. what do you call her, like a establishment figure? He's overcome that and he's beaten them in, on behalf of America. Mm. Yep. That's so that's awesome. your out, outlaw to ruler story right exactly. there, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Hillary is a woman who had her husband who cheated on her. She's overcome that. And then she was beaten by this corporate greedy guy. And now she's mm. in this place where, hey, 2020 is coming. Maybe she'll swoop in and try again. <laughs> and the campaigns did write those narratives to an extent. That would have been a whole part of it. It was their personal branding. How are we going to sell these to the to the voters? And, and they absolutely cast Trump in that hero sort of underdog narrative, which is totally ridiculous when you... <laughs> born to, when you think about it for five years, you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> when you think about it for five, yeah, literally, when you hold any kind of scrutiny to it, he's born into just mm. opulent, to, opulent to be, wealth. To be <laughs> fair, though, <laughs> there's there's a flip of that though as well, isn't there? You know, like portraying, uh, and this wasn't probably the entire campaign, but portraying Hillary Clinton as as some kind of like hard done by woman who's yeah, who's fighting off against the patriarchy, patriarchy because, exactly yeah yeah because she's in you know it's but i think that the sort of when you boil it down i think like the the sort of the key narrative they were trying to tell was elitism versus non-elitism and the ridiculousness mm. of that is that what does elitism even mean because surely grow you know inheriting billions and billions of <laughs> of dollars so, you know, from your <laughs> dad's estate and your uh, and his sort of corporate holdings is really kind of the definition of elitism. And then you look at Hillary Clinton, who was seen as the elite. Her mum was on food stamps yeah. when she was growing up, <laughs> and you're like, "Hang on, yeah, what? <laughs> it's like a complete the the I yeah the irony of 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 that is is interesting yeah and the the irony of the her journey if that's if that's true I didn't not realize that about Hillary Clinton actually mm. the irony of yeah, that um, her mum was of her abandoned story. as a child and um, essentially right. raised by I can't remember who it was someone else but 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 basically yeah lived on lived on food stamps for a long yeah. time. It's funny because just one generation on, obviously since then <laughs> she's made a lot of money and done a lot. Of pretty, pretty corporate, privileged. Corporate, yeah. corporate yeah. speaking, and as <laughs> you know, trans, that's the thing. Because the interesting thing with her, I suppose, she wasn't born into privilege. She found well, a way into. But really, yeah. you have to kind of say, well, it's how have people allowed themselves to swallow? those narratives maybe it's well it's probably the power of the story maybe the democrats just didn't tell as good a story they need some better writers on their books i don't know <laughs> you know what i mean i mean i think i think it comes down i'm probably going off topic a little bit but i think it always comes down to the fact that a complicated truth is harder to sell than a simple lie is there any corollary with with what because you mentioned before then john about how you the kind of stuff that you write it's quite important that it isn't too complicated yeah. Because it's going to make the story worse. Okay, I'll go back to my first novel, my very first novel I wrote, which never got published, and it will never get published because it's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I need okay. to read that. I need to read it. I read it, yeah. It's got, um, so this, this was a story I wrote called The Slip, and it was a, I tried to do basically like a Game of Thrones in space, kind of Game of Thrones, if you will. Um, <laughs> Game of Thrones. Yeah, but what I had was a post-Earth solar system. Yeah. So and people lived on the moon and, um, but they didn't know that Earth had been destroyed. They just thought it was like a asteroid belt. <laughs> and then I had a storyline in there that was a murder mystery, and there were these um, group called the Yao, which were like these almost like eternal post singularity beings that uploaded their minds to this kind of thing. But their family held that technology. And then along that, so I had a murder mystery involving one of them rebelling and leaving and killing her family. And then I had a storyline in there about bio pirates who were trying to steal seeds and kind of reverse engineer them so they could give them out to the people. And then I had a storyline about these traders. And it was like I had all these different, I had 13 different storylines going on that were all <laughs> crossing over. And I had, I think it was like 17 point of view characters and it was a fucking mess. It was just, 
it was crazy. But what's interesting is I sounds kind of amazing at the same time. Like, yeah, I mean, like I, I wasn't. Yeah. I didn't have the talent to write it. Is the thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think if I did it, I could. I could probably do it now. I think I had a massive ambition for what this thing could be, and it was just right an absolute mess. It, there Maybe was it's a collection of short stories rather than well. One. This is this is what I've done. Is I've actually. I've got I've salvaged some of the things as short stories ah. and they work well. Right. Yeah. So, so there's one where it's like there's a, a bit of a rebellion going on on Titan's orbiter, for example. Like that's yeah. a single story and it works <laughs> yeah. well and right. readers seem to like it. So what that led me to do was go, right, I need a story that's got one main character that has one main goal. <laughs> it's like Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was that and, and so I wrote that and then that became what ended up being my second novel, second public novel called Night of the Wasteland, which was a post-apocalyptic thing, and then ended up writing a prequel to that, which ended up being the first novel, and then I wrote the third novel. So to each iteration, I've, I've made it a bit more complicated in terms of the storytelling and what's going on, but I've tried to just really, really whittle the story down to just one mm. focus. I'm working on a set of stories at the minute that is going to be... 22 novellas when I'm done I've just written book eight <laughs> first draft of book nine as well so this is just following one character wow. it's told in a linear way but it is mm. really complicated because I'm I'm doing a lot of different layers of there's what I'd call like an external story which is set in the, in the world and she's got to overcome obstacles but then there's a few mysteries in the background and there's internal stories in the sense that she's got this magical awakening that's happened and she's got to deal with that and come to terms with the temptations of that. So I'm making it more complicated, but also because I'm doing this complicated stuff, I'm keeping other elements simple and grounded as as I can. Right. That makes sense. So it's like there's something for the reader to follow that's easy and then I can play around with that. I mean, I wrote a scene for the last book, I was just editing it yesterday, which is basically a scene from the point of view of a sentient ship, but the sentient ship can see through the eyes of its crew, so it was skipping mid-sentence between the views of all these different oh, wow. members. So it's really messed up, but you know, I've given the reader 200,000 words of lead up to this to allow me to do that. Right, uh, okay. I've kind of held the hand through and dropped hints about what these ships are like and what they do and then yeah it's allowed me to do that but oh wow i want to read that that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great i suppose what like on the kind of practical level i mean what mm. what is it that you do say you've got a singer like how is it that you're going right these are the things we need to emphasize these are the things that okay you've got this weird quirk let's not push that how are you doing that i mean is there some kind of practical uh, exercises you do or anything there's a few different things i mean there's some stuff around like uh, performance which is literally we watch them perform and we and we see see what works and what doesn't but that needs to be couched within the framework of the context so there's a stylistic context which is what's the kind of music that they want to be making but but kind of even below that there are these kind of archetypal sort of themes that we need to find that comes from conversation what i like about these so i might take them through the these 12 archetypes and get them to rate themselves out of 10 on each one where do they want to be how do they want to demonstrate which people do they want to attract how do they want to present themselves so then you have there's like a numerical value attached to each one I like to keep things as kind of organic as possible and use all of this stuff for when there's a decision needs to be made and it's difficult to make one. So they might they might come in the room and say, I've got no idea how I want to stage this set. I don't know where I'm going in terms of the fashion. I don't know. I don't even know maybe even which instruments they want on stage with them and how much they want in the backing track and how much they want on stage. And so our way of coming to a decision on that is reviewing this past stuff, you know, it's, and it's kind of like, okay, so you're saying that you, you want to be rebellious. How can we demonstrate rebellion or we need some kind of um, leadership symbolism here, or we need, you know, you've said earlier that this is what you want to do. So if they have answers already because they're creatives and I, you know, I, I feel like if it can come up organically, at least to begin with, as much as possible 
then that's that's the one because I I work for them, kind of for them rather than it's not like a there isn't a demand from me that they make money in a specific way because so it's kind of for, for me it's 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 about the art and it's about serving that as a kind of a, an educator that's uh, I suppose sort of paid by the hour and isn't attached to the need for profit to be made. Yeah. And this is the thing as well, teaching in an educational institution, I have I have a bunch of students that actually don't necessarily want to go on and be artists. They might want to go into teaching or they might want to go into, but the whole course is framed around this this need for them to build and uh, and create an, art, an artist. Right. I mean, obviously, because, I mean, we're having this discussion. So there's transferable skills that they can gain by oh, doing absolutely. all this stuff. You know, they can apply all of this thinking to any, well, their CV if they want to. Definitely. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. yeah. Um, so... I, I, another one that I haven't really mentioned is I, I like to play the why game with people to find core values. So it's basically, uh, well, we can do it. Do, does do, do one of you fancy being the, the subject of that? Okay, it. do you want to go ahead, John? Right, okay. So, John, name something that you like, first thing that comes into your head. Music. <laughs> music. Okay, you like music. Yes. Okay, fab. Um, why do you feel at home listening to music? Because I enjoy the fact that I can sit there, close my eyes, and not really have to think about anything. Okay. So, not having to think about anything. So, can we boil that down to a single word? Uh, Escape. Escape. Okay. Why do you feel at home when you're escaping? Because I am a creative person, and one of the things that happens when you're creative is you get bombarded with ideas (laughs) all the time. Mm -hmm. And... Mm -hmm. I just like that clarity and just not having, because it, it, it seems okay. to put a stop to that, if that makes sense. Yeah. So there were a few, there's a couple of threads there. One was creativity, right? And another one was clarity. Now, at this point, I would probably write those down and we might end up coming back and following both of those kind of strings. Yeah. Yeah. But for now, just pick one. Okay, so there's creativity for, or clarity. Let's go for clarity. So I clarity. I'm talking a lot about creativity today. Yeah, yeah, lovely. Okay, so clarity. Why do you feel at home when things are clear? <laughs> it's because there's a lot of noise around us. There's always distractions. There's always these things that go on in my head, which, you know, they could be positive thoughts, they can be negative thoughts, and they could be ideas for things. And sometimes it's just good to have that freedom from it to take a breath (laughs) okay so so you mentioned freedom there yeah why do you feel at home when you're free why do you feel at home when you're free because your thoughts often come when you don't necessarily want them to they can be invasive (laughs) Mm. and so if you can have that moment to clear you know it's like defragging a hard drive or something like that where you're just basically getting rid of the crap it's yeah it's something yeah. like that so I, I, I don't want to i don't want to push you to put, put any words in your mouth but you mentioned you nearly said to clear and and so we were getting back to this clarity place again right um is, is that a fair way of surmising so you like freedom because it brings you clarity and you like clarity because it brings you freedom. <laughs> are we? Are we? Are we? Think, by I the think, way, I think we've got that, some good circularity there. Yeah. We've got so that's an example of hitting a core value. Okay. So one, one or both of those words is like you can't really explain one without the other. You can't go down any further. You can't go deeper into the whys anymore. All right. There are other ways that where that happens. So, for example, sometimes people start trying to explain away the word that they've got to using like scientific or you know like biology or anthropologic language or something like that so it's kind of you know a human you know it might be love at the bottom for them and 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 it's kind of like well why do people feel love and then it's oh well you know love is an important device used for holding tribes together or what when you when you're there that's a core value sometimes people just don't know they they say oh i don't know why i care about freedom i don't know why i feel at home here i'm just this just it's right and that then would be an example of another core value for them. So those core values, first of all, it's really interesting to do for yourself because you get to know what's actually at the bottom of, of, of what the things I enjoy and the things I don't like. And often when you're unhappy, it will be because one of those core values is transgressed in some way. I can definitely say that. Yeah. But as an artistic tool, it can be really nice for you to ask, to, for you to decide your artistic persona. 
what are their core values? Are they the same as you as an individual? They might be, you know, for kind of like mm-hmm. your certain certain people, they, they want to make sure the music that they make really, really lines up with exactly them. But other people, maybe not. You, for example, Slipknot at the bottom of theirs, horror might be a core value or, you know, like destruction mm-hmm. or probably isn't the core value of the, of the artist that came up with the idea for Slipknot you know for for, for the mm. band members as, as individual people but it's a nice little thing to play so you know i don't know how, how could that apply for you john so maybe you could ask the question with your characters what are their core values mm. what's at the bottom of their decision making process where do they feel at home and yeah, why? yeah i mean i think i word this in like the intention and motivation stuff is like why is my character doing it because you know and it's always i try and make it lead back to something that you know, maybe I've given them a bit of a backstory that I don't necessarily print, but you know, yeah. I think well, she mm-hmm. reacts in this way. She doesn't trust people because she was let down loads of times by her dad in the past, and yeah. So and and the, yeah, the core value thing is, I think that's one thing as well with that I find useful in stories is that's almost got to shift. So if a character starts off and one of her core value is you can't trust anyone, you know, damn it, by the end she's gonna mm-hmm. be trusting and have friends and. I'm just trying to think of the word for that. What would that word be if you could boil it down? D- I don't trust anybody. What's uh, the mistrust? Is that, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I mean, would that be freedom? Would the core value be for that? It's kind of like not wanting to be held back by anybody. Yeah, I suppose it depend, not, depends on what's at the bottom of it, isn't in, it? Independence or yeah. yeah, but I suppose that's the that's the thing that might be an interesting game to play with that mm-hmm. with that character. I don't know. Maybe not. Probably wanting to not have your freedom curtailed. So it probably is freedom. It's it's yeah. the defence of your freedom. Right. And there's always that thing of, in stories especially, it's the idea that you give your character what they want, which in this case would be to be completely free and alone or something like that, but it's not what they actually need. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, the, I suppose yeah. there's a difference here then it, at the bottom of this is that we've got, in the stories, it, it is about the, the development of a character from point A to point B, where it's almost like... It, you're kind of creating a a static character, like a static representation or something like that, or helping someone come to terms with who they are in that moment or something like that. It's interesting because your core values almost become your brand guidelines. You know, whenever we're marketing a, an artist or, or, or a brand, it's everything you do, you kind of always come back to just how you know, you have some idea, some initiative you want to do, and then you take a step and go, how does this tie in with our brand guidelines? Brand guidelines, I really think, do come from your core values. What do you mean by brand guidelines? Like we were speaking about before, say like with, uh, say like Tetley's tea, where, you know, it's, uh, I think, I can't remember what the archetype we said for it was, but I think it's like, like the, the everyman. The everyman. Yeah. Or, yeah, exactly. And it's like, it's, it's, comforting it's attainable it's the opposite of like exclusive or it's i mean so everything that needs to sort of come back to that i think with a personality like you said when especially with ben when he's working with these young developing artists and maybe they're not quite sure what their sort of persona is a lot of the times i think actually when it works the best is when they already have their core values there they may not know that they have them and Mm. i think what you did there, Ben, was with the, the with the why exercise, is pulling it out of them. Yeah, it's already there. You're just pulling it out of them, mm. and then I'm sure that there's a light bulb moment when they go, Ah, that is me. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and often, uh, you know, when that ties in nicely with what their music is, that that's when it's a really strong brand. It's it's translating the core value into a brand guideline which is their sort of public facing identity i suppose and i think that's always way more effective when it's something that really is a core value and it's it's not just something that's contrived i think people can always sort of see through it when it's really contrived i don't know if you ever remember a guy called donny tourette at all (laughs) who was a i think he was a i want to say the towers of london was the band yeah 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 and he just seemed like the most contrived 
punk ever. Right. Um, <laughs> I remember yeah. him being on, um, I think it was like Nevermind the Buscocks, and he yeah. lit up a cigarette, and <laughs> the host just started like ripping into him, saying, oh, you're lighting up a cigarette, something that is legal in this country. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. I think he might have been in Big Brother as well, and like leapt out of the house, and you know, it's like these little yeah. stunts almost that just make yeah. people roll yeah. their eyes. So. Yeah. And again, yeah. I think what that is, is he's seen that archetype before and he's like, oh, I like that. I really resonate with that. I want to be that. But then he's just tried to put on that person's clothes and it's like, mm. yeah, maybe even worse. Maybe some label bigwig somewhere said, oh, we need a punk act. This is working right now. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's do this. Yeah. Uh, you're Absolutely. that person. And I've seen it happen. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're that person. Mm. I've seen it happen, and it's so it's so hard <laughs> to do if there isn't a sort of again core value. If there isn't, if it doesn't come back to yes, that is part of who I am. It's it's very rare for it to work. And even again, I sort of go back to the Madonna thing here when you say, well, Madonna always changes it up and does this and does that, and it's like, yeah, but I feel like it always does actually sort of come back from her. Like that's genuinely something that she's interested in at that moment she started as the sort of i want to say pop punk but i god i probably wouldn't even say that really but you know yeah and her thing was like the whole her whole name is like you know madonna the the archetype of the virgin mary versus the, the mary magdalene that's the two archetypes that she was sort of working with and that's why it was kind of controversial at yeah the time that she was like well i'm gonna marry these two into one because hey guess what <laughs> That is, uh, the, you know, that's reality. They're not these standalone archetypes. It, it's that it's not just one or the other, you know. Mm. <laughs> the, yeah. the, she's like human beings are more complex anyway. So, and then she's retold that story. She's sort of, you know, reinvented her self several times. But I feel like it probably does always sort of tie back to something she's genuinely interested in, in that moment. But when you put somebody, because what always happens is you get an artist that has something unique and it works and then you get five or six other kind of copycat versions of it that never really do quite as well they're always kind of half-assed and you can tell that the yep. really, really isn't to it and it's not really who they were or who they are and what they've essentially done is sort of abandoned their core values there you have to think of it like it's so, it's so many bands and I, you know you get one that sort of uh, comes out and then you get all of the copycat ones come out because yeah, you know, that happens you see, so oh, much. Saying, well, let's, let's put this, let's put something out there. Cause it's like that. Cause that's hot right now, but it's, it's always harder to, to, to follow the trend instead of making the trend. Mm. And then it's really hard to make the trend in the first place. But <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cause there's all stuff around zeitgeist, isn't there? And there were a lot of bands in the mid nineties that sounded, you know, strikingly similar to Oasis. <laughs> exactly. That's a great example. That is a great example. Obviously, I understand the business reasons for doing it because you're like, this is the thing right now. But um, there's always the flagship act that sort of, you know, and Oasis were arguably the flagship. Uh, I guess them and maybe, I don't know, Stone Roses maybe. Because sometimes actually what you get is the one before the flagship, which softened up the ground for that scene. Mm. And then you get the one that is just as invested in it and is yeah. um, genuinely into it. And genuinely that's their vibe, but they just come just at the right time where the, the sort of band that came before them softened up the ground a bit. Yeah. There was all that stuff with Nirvana as well, right? Yeah. There was the kind of the grunge thing was happening before them, but you know, they were the grunge act. Mm. Yeah. Which is why you can understand why a lot of the labels do this because they think, well, maybe that act that's happening right now is to soften up the ground one, and my one is going to be the one mm. that sort of takes advantage of that. So what um, we're saying is, but, but, is that some truth matters, right? For at least maybe in the music world, is from what is is what, like they they have to they have to be there has to be something real about what they're doing. I think people tend to see through it. If it's not, I think it just doesn't feel, unless you're a very, very, very good, yeah. unless the artist themselves is a very good actor. And I'd say somebody like Madonna actually maybe is a bit of a, like I said before, it probably doesn't really matter because she had this story that was really strong. And actually, I think because she manages to embody it, really, <laughs> I don't know. Madonna is the shapeshifter ar archetype, though. That is an archetype. Yeah. That's an archetype itself. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. So I that's think I think that's that's uh, fine. <laughs> Have any of you learned anything today? There's always a tension in fiction writing for me between my ideal reader and the market. 
Mm. There's the tension between my artistic truth or you know my desires as a as a as an artist as a creative and also making something that's palatable for a reader and it's it is that balance and right you mm. know this, this discussion about truth is what is interesting is i did a book that i released last may called blind gambit that i found really difficult to write i did a really really commercial novel it was like ready player one you know, it was basically about a guy mm. working through a game world, hero's journey, all that. I could not write just that story. And so alongside that, as a parallel story with the same character, I came up with the thing of he's visually impaired. He's dealing with going blind, which is something mm. personal to me. And so it's yeah. like about mm. him and his journey through coming to terms with blindness, coming to terms with dealing with his own independence and accepting help and all these issues. And now i think because i injected that truth i think it's the best thing i've written because wow. it's so personal mm-hmm. and honest and you know yeah and i think the people who've read it it's either this is crap because there's too much about this guy but then there's readers who've really resonated with it and it's like this is mm. i needed to read this you know it really mm. hit, hit home to me so yeah the true thing i think is just really important probably underestimated it until <laughs> you know talking about it now so yeah and even if it's a separate project where you get to just do you and not many people buy it but that you know mm. that can be in the music world it, that that can be the way you know it, it's yeah it's kind of like i think some of my students find that really important like that maybe those that that go and um that they're doing the covers gigs on weekends you know um mm-hmm. having having a, a, a thing that's that's their creative baby and they're not just doing carbon copy versions of the hits of the past 30 years yeah that can be really important for keeping the love yeah. of the even art even if it never sells even if they even if it's never a commercial objective i, I think that's mm. right and um because ultimately you're never going to please everyone and it's more important to balance sort of you know authenticity with what works for your audience and your tribe i suppose what they resonate with rather than trying to be all things to all people oh that's cool so and, and you chris the archetype uh wheel is something i actually hadn't even heard of uh yeah. now that i'm looking at it, it's absolutely i think subconsciously completely always been in play and everything that i've done which is so weird because i've never seen it you find that with young in general to be fair like yes it's, it's deep stuff i've only dipped my toes in but um i don't yeah. know if i, I dare to go much deeper <laughs> <laughs> the, the, that wheel actually i think is a really good exercise when working with a new artist and a new brand to be like where do you think you sit on this wheel yep uh, as a starting point just for unlocking you know their identity yeah and, and just on that like with really collaborations good. and things as well maybe you know yeah so yeah exactly if, if if you can find somebody that's in a similar place to you or maybe an opposite place but you know uh, however mm. you want to frame it but you can find yeah. someone who's um you know because I'm, I'm thinking about i remember when i first started teaching there was a band that was, grime was kind of up north anyway grime was becoming kind of a bit of a thing in the kind of the underground yeah. and it obviously was it was years after it happened in london because that's how it is sometimes mm. um yeah but um so, so that was kind of bubbling up. And then there was this kind of, there was also like a kind of death metal band. They, uh, this grime artist and this, the death metal band actually collaborated. It was really, really good. You know, looking back on that, part of the reason why I think it worked was because they both had this kind of outlaw, rebel, dark kind of rawness. Even though it yeah. turned up in different kind of musical traditions, probably different cultural backgrounds, different, it's like there's mm. something underpinning both of those. If, if I'd have had access to that wheel then, I could have been like, oh, right, so that works mm. for them. And then, you know, we could take. Are you yeah. familiar with the Enneagram at all? No. Enneagram. I've heard of it, yeah. Yeah, so this is this is similar to the, the wheel, except it does link. I think there's, I think there's nine personalities, I want to say, and it, it links them. And it's like, who will you clash with and who will you resonate ah. with? And it also has the thing of, okay, this is what the person is good at. These are their flaws. Here's how you can balance it. So that's, yeah, that's an interesting one. But, uh, Any of them. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Ooh, yeah. I've, I've learned some stuff. The, the 20 to 25% thing, the 66% thing, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, if, if anybody's writing their bio for their website or their, um, they're trying to frame the story of their band or um, 
uh, you know, just acknowledging that. That's cool. So I need to watch Cobra Kai. And what's the other thing I need to watch as well? There was another thing oh, that glow. came up. The one about the wrestling. What was yeah. I, I didn't write that down. Yeah. Oh, Glow. Yeah. Glow. Yeah. I've also learned I need to watch them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Definitely. Very good. Yeah. Have you got any plugs or anything you want to get out? I'm pretty good. Yeah, I'm I'm all right. There's there's not there's not much for me. For me, I just suppose if anybody is interested in kind of learning a bit more, like one of the things I'm developing is um, a sort of workshop slash masterclass thing that's specifically geared towards artists not necessarily just artists but it's it's more geared towards artists and how they you know develop an artist and how they navigate through not just the industry stuff but also this stuff that we're talking about personal branding and and hit me up chris hit me up escape. so yeah, i was gonna say that this up. is something that might be really useful for your students um but uh, yeah and if they want to find out more we're just at uh, melodradigital.com and you can find out more Excellent. And you can find me on Patreon now. So go on to patreon.com slash John Cruncher author. So if you've had any value from any of these shows or any of my other podcasts, please do offer your support. I post stories, articles and exclusive audio. So please do check that out. So until next time, cheerio. (laughs) 